Well, good morning. I want to welcome those of you that are in our classic service. And I want to welcome those of you at our Sioux campus. You're attending our very first Sunday morning service. And we're excited about launching this ongoing Sunday service there in Sault Ste. Marie. Well, this morning I've entitled our message, Easter's Bout with Doubt. And we're going to look at a story in the resurrection story of an individual that has an incredible bout with doubt. And you know, the truth of the matter is, all of us at times in our life will have a bout with doubt. Now, what brings about doubt in our life? Well, doubt happens when what we expect from God doesn't match what we experience in life. You see, when you expect something from God and then what you experience in life is different, there's a gap that's created. And it's in that gap that doubt rears its ugly head. And there are some times when you're in that bout with doubt that your foe seems to be an enormous enemy. You know those times that you expect God to be totally loving and, and, and a good God and then you turn on the TV set and you see all of the terrorism and destruction and evil and what you expect of God doesn't match what you experience in life and you begin to have a bout with doubt. It happens when you expect God to take care of you and to only bring good things into your life but then good things don't happen. And ultimately what you discover is that things go bad and you get sick and you lose your job and your, your marriage falls apart or, or, or you're standing in a freshly dug grave and what you expected from God isn't what you experienced in life and in that gap you are having a bout with doubt. Have you ever had one of those occasions where you prayed and you prayed and you prayed for God to do something? But God didn't come through. Nothing happened. In fact, the problem seemed to get worse. And what you expected from God isn't what you experienced in life. And as a result, you find yourself in the ring having a bout with doubt. And in the Bible, a guy named Thomas on Easter morning has a serious bout with doubt. So if you have your Bible, open them if you would to John chapter 20. And let's look at Easter's bout with doubt. Now in John chapter 20, I want to begin reading in verse number 19. Typically here at E-Free, when we read scripture, I have you stand. But today I'm going to let you keep seated because I'm going to stop along the way and give a little bit of explanation. John chapter 20 we pick up the story in verse number 19. Now, here's what it says. It says, so when it was evening on that day, what day? It's resurrection day. This is day one of the resurrection. That morning, Jesus had come out of the tomb. That morning, the women found the tomb empty. It was that morning that Peter and John raced to the tomb and found it empty. It's that same day. It's only evening. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Now, when it says the doors were shut, it's a word that means locked and bolted. I mean, they are secure in this room. Why? It says they're fearful of the Jews. It was the Jews who plotted to kill Jesus, remember? And now the disciples are afraid they're next on the list. Now the Jews are going to come after them. So they're in the upper room. They got the place shut up tight, and look what happens. It says, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. <laughs> I am so glad those were the first words out of his mouth. Because think about it. These guys are in a room that is secure. It is locked. No one knocks on the door. They don't let anyone in. But suddenly, Jesus is standing in the middle of them. Now, they know one thing for sure. They know that Jesus, just a couple days earlier, had died. They knew his cold, dead body had been put in the tomb. 
And they are freaking out. In fact, Luke tells us in his passage that they were thinking it was a ghost. And I am so glad that the first words Jesus said to them was, peace. You know, I have officiated the funeral for a lot of people in the 30 years I've been a pastor. And if the day ever comes, and I hope it doesn't, but if the day ever comes where that morning I do a funeral and we put the body in the ground and we cover the ground with dirt, and then I'm sitting at home in my locked, secure house, and suddenly the person whose funeral I preached that morning, who I watched them put in the ground, is standing in front of me. I really hope his first words or her first words are, Peace, because if they just say, hey, dude, I am out of there. You know what I'm saying? So the disciples are freaking out because they see what they think is a ghost. And that's why Jesus, when you read Luke's account, will say to them, see my scars, touch them, know that this is flesh and blood. Ghosts don't have bodies. Give me something to eat. I'll show you because ghosts don't eat. They don't have bodies. So he proves to them he's not there in spirit. He is there in his resurrected body right there. Now, by the way, you know what that means? That means that in his resurrected body, his molecules were so perfect, he could literally walk through the wall, walk through the door. It's going to be fun when we get our resurrected bodies, you know? And here's Jesus, and he's in the room. At first, they're freaked out. But he obviously is able to calm them down. Now, look what it says when we drop down to verse number 24. Verse 24 now brings in the bout with doubt. And it says, but Thomas, one of the 12, one of the disciples, called Didymus. That was his nickname, Didymus. Now, that seems like a weird nickname, but it's a word that literally means twin. So what we know is that Thomas had a twin. Now, we don't know who the twin is. The Bible doesn't say anything about his twin. We don't know if it's a boy, a girl, identical, not identical. We just know he's a twin. Because of that, his nickname is Didymus. Thomas, one of the 12 called Didymus, was not there when Jesus came. Now, we don't know where he was, but he wasn't there. Verse 25. So the other disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. I mean, they're like, well, Thomas, you should have been here, man. He came right in. He walked through the wall. He showed us his scars. We touched him. He ate things. He talked to us. And Thomas responds this way. He says, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and I put my finger in the place of the nails and I put my hand in his side, I won't believe. And it's based on that verse that he now gets a new nickname, Doubting Thomas. Now, by the way, I want you to understand something. Thomas wasn't in any way more doubtful than any of the other disciples. Because when Jesus first appeared to the other ten, they didn't believe it. They thought it was a ghost. What made them believe it? They saw his nail scars. They touched him. Thomas isn't asking for anything more. Listen, Thomas wasn't any more doubtful than any of the other disciples. And Thomas says, no, no, no. Unless I see it, I don't believe it. So how does Jesus respond to that? How does Jesus respond to our doubt? Verse 26. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and this time, Thomas is with them. And Jesus came to the door, came, the doors having been shut again, and stood in their midst, and once again he says, peace be with you. Then he talks directly to Thomas. I love that. Directly to Thomas. And he says, Thomas, reach here with your finger, see my hands. Reach here with your hand, put it in my side. Don't be unbelieving anymore, but be believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, and this is one of the greatest confessions in all the Bible. He says, my Lord and my God. It's Easter's bout with doubt. Now, from that story, there are five principles that we can learn on this resurrection morning about bouts with doubt that we have. Let me give them to you. Principle number one is this, and it's an important one. Having a spiritual bout with doubt can occur in even the strongest of believers. 
Think about it. Having a bout with doubt can occur in even the strongest of believers. You know, unfortunately, Thomas gets a bad rap. I mean, today when I were to say, hey, who are your top 10 favorite people, heroes of the Bible? No one puts Thomas on their list. Yeah, Downing Thomas, he's my favorite. We don't do that. Thomas gets a bad rap. But do you realize that when you study Thomas in the Bible, he had an amazing spiritual commitment with the Lord? Do you realize, obviously, number one, Jesus called him to be a disciple, and Thomas was willing to leave everything behind and follow Jesus with everything he had. That takes a level of commitment, folks. But that's not it. In John chapter 11, Jesus says, we're going to go to Judea. And the disciples knew that in Judea, the Jews were plotting to kill him. And the disciples also know if they kill Jesus, they're likely going to hurt us too. So the disciples began to debate with Jesus in John 11, trying to talk him out of it, saying, no, Jesus, let's not do that. Let's not go to Judea. But Jesus would not be persuaded. And when Jesus finally said, no, guys, this is it. We're going. I love Thomas's words. Thomas looked at the other disciples and said, all right, guys, let's go with him so we can die with him. Now, some people say, what a pessimistic attitude. No, that was a statement of courage. That was a statement of commitment. You know what Thomas was saying? Even though it looks like this could result in our death, I am so committed to Jesus, I'm willing to go with him anyway. He was a man of great spiritual commitment. In John 14, when Jesus says to the disciples, I'm leaving you, and you know the way, it's Thomas who spoke up and said, Lord, we don't know the way. Tell us so we can come. What was Thomas doing? He was saying, Jesus, I want to be wherever you are. So make sure if you're going ahead of us somewhere, make sure you leave behind directions so we know how to get there because I want to be wherever you are. You see, folks, listen. Thomas was a man of great spiritual commitment. Spiritual doubt can happen to even the strongest of believers. Remember a guy named John the Baptist? One of the greatest heroes in the Bible. In fact, Jesus called him the greatest man ever born of a woman. And you know what happened to John the Baptist at the end of his life? He's in prison. And he has a bout with doubt. And as a result, he sends his disciples to Jesus to ask him this question. Are you the one that was promised as the Messiah? Or should we look for another? He was having a bout with doubt. Ladies and gentlemen, listen. Even the strongest believers can end up having a bout with doubt. That doesn't mean you're a second-class Christian. It doesn't mean you're weak in your faith. The first principle I learned is this. If you're having a spiritual bout with doubt, you are in very good company because even the strongest of believers can have a bout With doubt. Well, the next two principles really focus on what makes us more susceptible to having a bout with doubt. Here's principle number two we become more susceptible to having a spiritual bout with doubt when we do life outside of community. Let me ask you a question Why did it take Thomas longer to believe than it did the other 10 disciples? Well, the answer is pretty obvious, isn't it? Because they experienced something together that Thomas missed. Remember when Jesus appeared the first time, Thomas wasn't there. Now, we don't know where he was. The Bible doesn't say. He may have had a legitimate reason for not being there, but nonetheless, he wasn't there. And as a result, the others experienced this amazing thing when Jesus appears, and they believe, and Thomas is at a disadvantage. You know why? Because Thomas wasn't part of the community at the time. Listen, God never designed you to do your journey of faith by yourself. Anytime you try to do your journey of faith by yourself, you will be at a disadvantage. Well, sure, people will often say this. They'll say, well, wait a second, wait a second. I can worship God in my living room by myself. I I can worship God in the woods by myself. Yeah, you can, but I'm telling you right now. 
When you try to worship the Lord and do your journey of faith outside of community, you are at a disadvantage. You will never grow to the extent you could if you're involved in Christian community. You know what this story does? This story tells us that when you miss church, you miss Jesus. That's really what it's saying. Hey, listen, let me tell you something. I believe in all my heart that one of the reasons I grow strong in my walk of faith is because I do life in community with other believers. And when you do life outside of community, you know what happens? You put yourself at a disadvantage. You become more susceptible to having some spiritual bouts with doubt. I want to challenge you. Challenge you to take steps to say, I'm going to be a little more regular in my church attendance. If you typically come once a year, come twice a year. If you typically come once a quarter, try once a month. If you typically come once a month, try every other week. If you typically come every other week, try every week. Because when you live outside of community, you put yourself at a disadvantage and you become more susceptible to having a spiritual bout with doubt. Let me give you principle number three. What else makes us more susceptible? Principle three, we become more susceptible to having a spiritual bout with doubt when we fail to fully understand the word of God. Now, that's what happens in the story. You see, here's the thing that's amazing. Those disciples are in the upper room and they are fearful and they're, they're living in fear, not anticipation. They're not anticipating a resurrection, but they should have been. You know why they should have been? Because in the Old Testament, the prophets predicted over and over that the Messiah would die and rise again. In fact, Jesus, in his own words, told the disciples that on more than one occasion. But the disciples didn't understand the word. And because of that, they became more susceptible to having a bout with doubt. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the more you know your Bible the less susceptible you are to having a bout with doubt. And let me tell you why. Because the Bible teaches me two very key things. It teaches me, number one, the character of God. When I study my Bible, I learn the character of God. I learn what God is like. And not only do I learn the character of God, I learn about the promises of God. The many promises, over 7,000 promises in the Bible that God has made. Now, why does that help me to be strong in, in opposing about with that? Well, here's why. You see, when I come into those times in my life, and it happens all the time, just like with you, when what I expect of God doesn't match what I experience in life, and there's this gap there, automatically doubt rears its ugly head. But when I know my Bible, I can do this. I can say, even though there's a gap, I'm going to choose to trust in the character of God. Now listen, I can't trust in a God that I don't know anything about. The more I know his character, the more I can trust him. And how do I learn his character? I learn it right here in the Bible. You see, when those gaps come into my life, because what I expect of God doesn't match what I experience in life, and doubt rears its ugly head and begins throwing jabs at me, I can choose to trust the promises of God. How do I know the promises of God? Because they're right here in the Word of God. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the greatest things that you can do to protect yourself from having those bouts with doubt is to make a commitment to learn your Bible better. If you don't read your Bible on a regular basis, can I challenge you? Start doing that. One chapter a day. You say, I don't have a Bible. See an usher on the way out, they'll give you a Bible. We'll make sure you have one in your hands because you become more susceptible to bouts with doubt when you fail to understand the Word of God. Principle number four. The worst way to respond to having a spiritual bout with doubt is to withdraw from our walk with the Lord. That's the worst way to respond, to withdraw from our walk with the Lord. And I see people do it all the time. I see people come into a time in their life 
when what they expect of God doesn't match what they experience in life and doubt rears its ugly head and it throws enough jabs at that person just says, forget it. I don't need this Christianity thing. And they walk away. I'm so glad Thomas didn't do that. He didn't. How do we know? Because the Bible said in that passage I read for you, eight days later, Thomas was still with the disciples. He had an abandoned ship. He had it walked away. Yeah, he was struggling with doubt, but folks, doubt isn't unbelief. Doubt can lead to unbelief, but it's not unbelief in and of itself. And Thomas still stayed. He did not walk away from the Lord. He said very clearly, here's the step I'm going to take. If I see it with my own eyes, if I touch it with my own hands, I'll believe it. Here's what I love about Jesus. I think it's the greatest part of the story. You know what Jesus does? He meets Thomas right where Thomas is. How does he do it? Eight days later, he appears in the upper room. And what does he do? He talks directly to Thomas. says, Thomas, he, 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 here's those scars. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me if Jesus took Thomas's hand and said, Thomas, here, feel this scar. Here, Thomas, feel the hole in my side. Now, Thomas, quit doubting. Start believing. And Jesus met Thomas right where he was at. He didn't scold Thomas. He didn't rebuke Thomas. He didn't condemn Thomas. He met Thomas right where where he was at. And ladies and gentlemen, that's what he'll do for you this morning. No matter what bout with doubt you're having, you take a step toward Jesus, and I promise you, he will meet you right where you are at. I got an email this week. An email from a guy named Greg Greg was in my church that I pastored back in Indiana 20 years ago, back in Indiana. And I'll never forget Greg because he was the tallest person I've ever seen in my life. I looked like at his kneecap. Tall guy. But he wrote me an email just this week. He said, Pastor Scott, it was 20 years ago, back in Indiana on Easter Sunday, that I walked into your church for the first time. And he said, I walked in at agnostic an alcoholic, my marriage was falling apart, I hated anything dealing with religion, I didn't want to be there, I went to the back row, I sat down, I crossed my arms, I crossed my legs, and with a scowl on my face, I hated the fact that I was there. By the way, there are probably some Gregs right here this morning. You're not here because you want to be here, you're here because you kind of got persuaded to be here. You don't really like that you're here, but you're here. But that's okay. You know why? Because the very fact that you are here, no matter what brought you here, is a step of faith. You took a step of faith by walking into this church today. And I know for a fact, because you took a step of faith, God will meet you right where you're at. He did, Greg. Greg reminded me in that email. He said, for the first time in my life, I heard a message that changed my life. He said, I always thought religion was a list of do's and don'ts that just made us miserable. But you shared with me that God loved me. You shared with me that he died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sins, that he rose from the dead, that he could forgive me, that he would give me a home in heaven, that he wanted a relationship with me. He said, I had never heard that before. And he said, I kept coming back. And six months later, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And so did my family. In fact, I'll never forget, a couple years after that, Greg came up to me one Sunday and said, Scott, would you pray for my dad? His name's Walt, and he's dying of cancer. The doctor's just given him a few days to live. I said, well, I'd be, I'd be honored to, Greg. Is he local? And he said, yeah, he's in the hospital here locally. I said, well, how about if I go visit him? And Greg said, oh, no, please don't do that. I said, Why? He said, because my dad hates preachers. I said, well, what's, what does your dad like? He likes Notre Dame football. I said, well, I'll go talk to him about Notre Dame football. So I went down to the hospital. I went into Walt's room. I introduced myself to him, and, and uh, he didn't like the fact that a preacher was in his room, but I brought up Notre Dame football. We talked for a while, and I went back several days, and I would try to get the conversation over to spiritual things, and he would always just take it right back to Notre Dame football. 
They ended up sending Walt home to die. And one morning I went by his house, I knocked on the door, Walt opened the door, and you could tell he was bad. He was ill. He said, Reverend, he's the only person my whole life who ever called me a Reverend. He said, Reverend, I, I can't talk today, I'm sick. I said, okay, Walt. And I reached in my pocket and I pulled out what we call a gospel tract. That gospel tract had that same message in it that his son Greg had heard on that Easter Sunday. And I said, would, would you read this when you get time? He said, yeah. I got a call from Greg late that night. He said, Pastor Scott, are you sitting down? I said, should I be? He said, I think you ought to. I said, what's up? He said, I got a call from my dad today. And, and, and my dad said, you got to come over right now. I went over and my dad said to me, Greg, the reverend stopped by today. I said, okay. He said, he gave me this piece of paper that told me how I could have my sins forgiven. Told me how I could know for sure I'm going to heaven. Greg said, okay. He slid the paper across the table to Greg and said, look, look on the back of it. On the back of that piece of paper, there was a spot where you could, if you were making the decision to trust Jesus to be your savior, you could sign your name. Walt had signed his name. Greg said, Dad, did you mean this? And with tears coming down his face, he said, with all my heart, I meant it. I called Walt up the next day. I said, well, I heard you gave your life to Jesus last night. He said, oh, yeah, Reverend, I did. Now, you need to come over here and talk to my wife. She needs it bad. So I went over that night. I talked to Mary. Mary gave her life to Christ. It was such an incredible thing. And you know what it all started? It all started, that whole thing started when Greg took a step of faith he didn't even know he was taking by walking into that church on that Easter Sunday morning, even though he did not want to be there. Jesus will meet you right where you are at. Look at the fifth principle. Fifth principle is this. While having a spiritual bout with doubt can affect any of us, we must always remember that our goal is to build our faith. You see, folks, listen. Spiritual bouts with doubt aren't always bad because if we respond properly, it actually builds our faith. That's what happened to Thomas. When he saw the nail prints, Thomas falls on his knees and gives one of the greatest confessions that you can find in the Bible when he says, my Lord and my God. And his bout with doubt solidified his faith. You know, tradition tells us that he ended up going all the way to India, preaching and sharing Jesus, and ultimately getting thrown in a pit and killed with a spear because of his walk of faith. All of that happened because he had a bout with doubt, but he didn't walk away with the Lord, from the Lord. He took a step of faith, and Jesus met him right where he was at. By the way, in verse 29 of that passage, Jesus does something amazing. Listen to what he says. In verse 29, Jesus says this. He says to Thomas, because you've seen me, you've believed, but blessed are those who haven't seen me, but they believe. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about you and me. We've never seen Jesus with our own eyes. We haven't touched his nail-scarred hands. But I can tell you this. I believe with every fiber of my being, he is alive, he is God, and he is the only way to heaven. So what do you do? What do you do when you find yourself in the boxing ring? What do you do when you're having one of those spiritual bouts with doubt? Let me give you just a few things quickly based on those principles. Number one, don't condemn yourself. Don't condemn yourself when you're having a bout with doubt. Even the greatest of believers have bouts with doubt. God doesn't look at you any less. He doesn't love you any less because you're having a bout with doubt. Don't condemn yourself. Number two, connect with believers. The more you find believers to do community with, the more it will help you in your bout with doubt. Number three, read your Bible. Because the more you know the word of God, the less susceptible you become to bouts with doubt. Number four, lean into the Lord. Don't walk away from him. Trust his character. When you come to those times in your life when what you expect from God doesn't match what you experience in life, don't walk away. Trust his character. Trust his promises. And number five, Nail down your faith. Nail it down once and for all. Listen, folks, no one is born a Christian. No one. 
We are all born sinners. You're not born a Christian. You become a Christian. When do you become a Christian? When you take that step of faith and you make that decision to say, I choose to put my faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, receiving him as my savior from sin. That's when you become a Christian. So I want to ask you a question. Can you look back to a time in your life when you made that decision of faith? If you say, well, I, I've just always been a Christian. No, you haven't. If you think you've always been a Christian, I can guarantee you you're not a Christian because no one's born a Christian. You make the choice to put your faith in Jesus. And if you know you've never done that, or if you're not sure you've ever done that, why not make today the day you nail it down so that the next time someone asks you, you can say, well, it may have been before that, I don't know, but one thing I know for sure, on Easter 2017, I nailed it down. I chose to put my faith in Jesus. Would you bow with me for prayer? With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here this morning and you've never put your faith in Jesus, you can't look back to a time when you did that or you're not sure you've ever done it, but you're ready this morning to put your faith in Jesus. You can do it right now, right where you're seated. The Bible says, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Listen, it's not the words that make the difference. It's your faith. And you could right now, where you sit in the quietness of your heart, you can whisper in your thoughts this prayer to the Lord. He hears your thoughts. You can say, dear Jesus, I choose today to put my faith in the fact that you died for my sins. You rose again from the dead. And you're the only way to heaven. I receive you right now as my Savior. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, and I ask you to give me a home in heaven. And ladies and gentlemen, if you're here this morning with our heads still bowed, our eyes still closed, and you're a Christian, you know there's been that time, you put that, that, that stake in the ground, you trusted Jesus to be your Savior, but you've been having a bout with doubt, today is a great day for you to take a step of faith. Right now where you're seated, you can say this to the Lord, Lord Jesus, I choose today to trust your character. I choose today to trust your promise. What I've expected hasn't matched what I've experienced, but that's okay. I'm not going to walk away. I'm going to choose today to take a step of faith. I want to pray for you now, and as soon as I'm done praying, Pastor Jim's going to take over in our classic service, and Pastor Steve is going to take over in our Sault Ste. Marie campus. But let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the story of this wonderful man named Thomas. He gets a bad rap. Today, we call him Doubting Thomas, but he was such a hero in my eyes because here's a man who did not walk away when he doubted. But rather, he used that bout with doubt to allow you to meet him where he was at and solidify his faith. Father, many have done that right now this morning. There are many in this room right now who have just made the decision to trust Jesus Christ to be their Savior. I pray for them. I pray that they would be willing to let others know that they made that decision. Because that's going to help them in their bout with doubt. If, if they keep it to themselves, they're going to always have doubt. But if they tell others what they've done, it helps to solidify it. I think of those who are here today as believers who, in an area of their life, have been having a bout with doubt. I pray for them. I pray that they'll take steps of faith. They'll be involved in community, in church. They'll read their Bible. I pray that they'll trust in your character and in your promises in those gap times of their life. And Father, I pray that you'd help us all together, like Thomas, to become more solidified in our faith so we can serve you with every fiber of our being until Jesus returns or until you call us home. Thank you, Jesus, for coming out of the tomb to give us eternal life. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.